Greetings and uh, welcome to our fourth public lecture. And uh, this lecture is on the Kumara and uh, also the Polynesian uh, migration. And the idea is to link the uh, spread of the Kumara with the Polynesian migration. The first question that we have to ask is where did the Polynesians get their Kumara varieties? And uh, this is where the migration uh, comes in because uh, in history, there are uh, a number of uh, proposed uh, theories as to the origin of the Polynesians. And uh, it is quite possible that uh, the Kumara and um, the traditional crops of the Polynesians had uh, spread with their migration. Um, the ancient Polynesian migration is like driving in the country. There is no one in sight for miles and miles, but uh, the navigator and the passengers of the Kalia or the canoe. And they are confident that uh, they will arrive at their destination, just like the modern Google GPS uh, system that people use today, uh, just driving through the countryside. But uh, in ancient times, uh, the sailing of the Kalia or the canoe was very much uh, based on uh, star maps and uh, traveling from one island to the other depended on the uh, landmarks or sky marks. So when you drive through the countryside, there are landmarks that uh, tell you where you are. And uh, similarly, traveling uh, by sailing through the ocean, there are star maps and uh, star indicators or marks to tell you where you are. And in ancient times, the Polynesians also use uh, many other things uh, like uh, floating uh, debris, the sky, the birds, the uh, color of the water and so on to uh, navigate. And uh, just a very uh, rough look at the various migration theories to uh, uh, give us an idea of where the Kumara uh, played a role in the migration stories. Uh, the very first uh, theory we'll look at is the Maori and Cook Island oral history, uh, as uh, told in the Journal of the Polynesian Society, uh, indicated here by the black arrows. The story started uh, in uh, India, or that uh, land mass, and uh, the uh, uh, Maori and Cook Island uh, oral history uh, suggests that uh, the Polynesians uh, had uh, lived in the Indian landmass, and they had a war with uh, a tall, black, uh, uh, lanky uh, race, and they lost the war. And so they moved from there into Southeast Asia, uh, specifically uh, uh, Indonesian islands. And uh, they had spent uh, about uh, a thousand years there. And from there, they uh, spread to uh, Hawaii and through uh, the Bismarck and uh, New Guinea Islands to Melanesia and Polynesia. 
Um, that story also uh, includes a lot of uh, uh, voyages uh, into uh, parts of uh, Oceania by the Polynesians. The uh, next uh, theory, or the main accepted theory, is the migration from uh, the Asian landmass through South East Asia, through the uh, Bismarck and New Guinea Islands into uh, uh, Oceania, uh, Melanesia and Polynesia. And one of the uh, uh, evidence for this uh, migration is the Lapita pottery. Um, the age or time uh, uh, indicator was uh, around 3,000 years ago. So it was at about the same time as the Maori and Cook Island uh, oral history. The next um, theory we'll look at is uh, what I call the Mount Builders as proposed and uh, uh, made popular by uh, Tongan American uh, David Tafale, who uh, uh, described himself as a self-taught astronomer. And uh, he says that uh, migration had started in the Asian landmass and they crossed the Bering Strait into North America and down through Central America and into South America and into Oceania. And uh, there were also various uh, uh, other people who uh, entered Oceania from the North American continent. And the evidence for that theory is the large number of mounds found in the North American uh, landmass uh, where large, uh, tall uh, people were found buried. And uh, on the island of Tongatapu uh, in Tonga, for example, uh, satellite pictures uh, have shown that uh, more than 10,000 mounds uh, can be seen on the uh, uh, Tongatapu island. And um, we all know from uh, history that uh, many of these mounds uh, have uh, very large, tall people buried underneath. Uh, one excavation, for example, uh, had found uh, uh, bone, uh, uh, I suppose, a skeleton that was uh, eight feet tall. So the person would have been more than eight feet tall uh, in life. And the shortest person uh, that was found in that uh, grave uh, was about uh, six uh, feet seven. So these were very tall people. And uh, David Tafale claimed that uh, these mount builders had come through uh, from North America into the Pacific. Uh, the next uh, uh, theory we'll look at is uh, what, what was uh, made popular by uh, uh, Four Hyatt Owl in his writings and uh, shown in the yellow uh, lines here that these uh, people migrated from uh, that same Asian landmass through the Atlantic into South America and into um, Polynesia. And uh, the evidence as provided by Fort Hyadal when he sailed his uh, Kontiki raft from Peru and landed in uh, uh, French Polynesia. And he proposed that uh, it was quite possible that uh, people had come from there. And he also wrote about uh, stories uh, told to him by the Inca Indians that there was a white race of people that came through uh, South America and uh, into uh, Oceania. And these were the uh, so-called uh, white gods. At about the same time that uh, Tangaroa and the 
the kings appeared in Oceania at around uh, 4500 AD. And uh, many of uh, the stories about Tangaroa suggest that uh, he was a white man uh, and his children had uh, yellow hair or they were blonde. Um, the uh, next uh, theory is what I call the Celtic theory, uh, shown here in red. Uh, some people are saying that uh, there was also a migration from Europe. And uh, one evidence, of course, is that uh, uh, the Vikings had visited uh, uh, North America before Columbus. And uh, some stories suggest that uh, some of these uh, uh, people from Europe had gone through South America and into the Pacific. Uh, before the Maori arrived in New Zealand, for example, uh, there were already three groups of people in New Zealand, the Moriori, the Patupayarehe, and uh, another group known as the Ponaturi. And uh, the Patupayarehe were the white race uh, who uh, uh, have uh, descendants today claiming that they had actually originated uh, in the Asian landmass, uh, very similar to the story by uh, Fort Heyerdahl. And uh, they had come through uh, South America into New Zealand. And these descendants have blonde hair, green eyes, uh, and uh, fair skin, and uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, Pākehā-looking uh, people. And the fact that uh, the name Pākehākehā uh, refers to uh, uh, these white Patupayarehe, uh, 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 is a uh, suggestion that uh, there might be some uh, 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 substance in that four Heyerdahl uh, story. What is uh, most interesting is that uh, the Bible story of Abraham uh, also uh, suggests that uh, he came from that area in the uh, Asian uh, landmass and he moved from there and his family to uh, Canaan, what is uh, now modern uh, Israel. Uh, and uh, I have also indicated here in question mark that uh, it may be possible that the white uh, people of Europe had also come from that area. And uh, what is very interesting is that uh, uh, the story of the Garden of Eden uh, actually uh, starts uh, or is uh, located in that area. And also the story of the Noah's Ark after the great flood which uh, killed uh, all living uh, things on earth, only the uh, Ark and uh, Noah's family were the survivors, and they had landed in Turkey, <coughs> in that area there, and uh, probably uh, populated the earth and then migrated out from that area. Uh, what is uh, very interesting uh, in all these stories is that uh, there is no mention of migration from Australia. But um, the uh, Aboriginals have been known to uh, uh, live in Australia for 40,000 years or so, according to some uh, uh, records. And there is no mention of them coming into the Pacific. But uh, um, the fact that uh, there are people in Melanesia which uh, may have originated in Australia uh, suggests that there was a migration from there too. And also uh, the uh, existence of uh, a thousand uh, 
dialects of uh, or languages in uh, Papua New Guinea. <coughs> also, uh, I suggest that there was uh, quite a large number of uh, different races coming through there, and uh, some of them uh, uh, actually uh, settling there, uh, which is why there's so many different languages. Uh, let's um, um, focus our talk now on uh, the migration and the sweet potato after discussing that uh, very general um, migration uh, of uh, what possibly could be uh, the origin of the Polynesians. Uh, <clears throat> Discussing just the uh, seven Kalia of the Great Fleet, or the uh, large canoes uh, that came to New Zealand from uh, Hawaii, it is known that uh, they had brought uh, Kumara with them, and these. Uh, large uh, canoes were the Aotea, the Kurahaupo, Mataatua, Tainui, Tokomaru, the Arawa, and Takitimu. I have drawn here uh, some arrows to indicate uh, the various travels of the Polynesians. The Great Fleet uh, uh, migration is marked here in black from uh, Hawaii to New Zealand. Hawaii is the uh, area of uh, the Society Island uh, where Tahiti and Raiatea uh, situated today, uh, those islands were known as Hawaii in ancient times. And uh, in the blue here, I have shown the uh, various migrations and voyages um, according to the uh, Maori and uh, Rarotonga oral history prior to the uh, Great Fleet. And these were during the first 1,000 years AD. The uh, ye yellow arrows here uh, is uh, an indication of the Polynesian travels to and, fr and from South America. Uh, there is evidence that uh, Polynesian visited uh, the coast of South America. And there's also mention uh, that uh, they possibly uh, uh, picked up women, among other things, uh, uh, including the sweet potato. Uh, and in blue here, there is uh, the possibility that uh, sweet potato spread from here uh, through Central uh, to North America. Uh, and in the black, uh, the uh, spread of uh, the large tuber sweet potato from America to Oceania, which uh, were brought by whalers. Uh, the spread of the sweet potato into Polynesia uh, was during the uh, pre-European times uh, and the later spread from North America was uh, during the, the whaler uh, uh, age and also uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese 
who had uh, taken the sweet potato and spread it to uh, the uh, East Indies and the Philippines, and from there it spread to other parts of uh, Asia. Uh, let's have a uh, quick look at uh, why the Polynesians uh, uh, grew or wanted uh, Kumara. Um, well, firstly, the Kumara is a very high yielding and nutritious uh, root crop. And also, it grew everywhere in Oceania. Uh, even though the uh, Maori brought the uh, taro and the yam to New Zealand, the uh, kumara uh, did much better. Uh, even today, uh, the kumara is grown uh, in New Zealand uh, in large quantities, but uh, taro and uh, yam are not. Um, Kumara can be easily grown uh, anywhere in Oceania. They also have a very short growing cycle. Uh, you can harvest the Kumara in uh, four months, five months, um, and they can be carried by the Kalia or the Tapo, uh, giant Tapo Halt canoes and can be stored as food during voyages. And in comparison, the uh, taro and the yam, it takes about a year to harvest. And so uh, kumara was a much more uh, efficient uh, food crop and better suited to the uh, uh, Polynesian uh, travels. And kumara also was a great substitute for rice. Uh, during the voyages, uh, as explained uh, by the Journal of the Polynesian Society, the um, Maori and Rarotongan uh, uh, oral history, for example, uh, were probably uh, talking about migrations using rice uh, as food during those voyages. But uh, later, when they moved into Oceania, uh, the Kumara took over from the rice. Uh, and this is probably why uh, the travels uh, to South America um, had occurred, uh, not only to bring uh, uh, more varieties of Kumara, but also uh, to procure uh, women, uh, which uh, were uh, scarce in some uh, islands in the uh, uh, Pacific. And uh, some literature did mention the role of women uh, in those uh, voyages. Uh, let's now look at the uh, Kumara and how it influenced the uh, uh, culture of the Maori. Uh, when the Great Fleet arrived in 1350, uh, they had brought uh, a number of uh, Kumara varieties with them, and these were grown in Whangaparoa, uh, the varieties uh, from the Te Arawa canoe, one of the uh, Great Fleet canoes, and uh, some of the varieties were grown uh, in the Bay of Plenty, and some were grown in Auckland. And uh, these uh, varieties were known as uh, Taroa Mahoe, Pehu, Huti Huti, Rekamaroa, and a few others. And uh, in Auckland, for example, uh, uh, the original uh, varieties were grown um, until 1942. And uh, they might have been uh, Huti Huti and uh, Rekamaroa in some other uh, varieties. 
uh, but um, it is stated that uh, uh, during World War Two and uh, World War One, uh, some of these uh, uh, Kumara, uh, um, I suppose, gardeners uh, had uh, uh, ceased because of the lack of labor. Uh, most likely because uh, the men were going off to the war and to work in the war industries and uh, no one to do the gardening. The most uh, important consideration in uh, using a food source is its ability to uh, provide energy and uh, sustenance. And this is uh, a great uh, advantage of the Kumara, not only be, uh, because of the short uh, growing season that you can harvest the Kumara um, twice or even three times in the islands. And in New Zealand, you can harvest uh, in four months or so, uh, but also uh, it's very nutritious and provides uh, uh, a very, uh, good source of energy and um, even in the uh, um, islands uh, Captain uh, Cook mentioned that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, Kumara and the uh, Ufi and Taro and the um, uh, paper mulberry known as Aute in Maori were growing in the uh, Bay of Islands when he visited. Uh, this picture shows uh, three of the early uh, uh, Great Fleet uh, varieties of uh, Kumara. Uh, as you can see from the uh, ruler at the bottom that uh, these uh, tupers were up to a foot long and uh, probably uh, five centimeters uh, wide. So they were quite sizable. Uh, this picture here shows some drawings of the early uh, uh, tuber of the uh, Kumara. Um, there's uh, four uh, varieties here, the Rekamaroa, Huti Huti, Pehu, and uh, Taroa Mahoe. Uh, and we can tell they uh, look more or less uh, similar to uh, modern varieties of Kumara. And this slide uh, shows the uh, the leaf shape of the ancient uh, Kumara varieties and also the uh, tuba shape and how they look and they are more or less uh, the same with uh, modern uh, Kumara varieties which uh, suggests that uh, these ancient uh, uh, Kumara varieties may have been uh, uh, contributing to the current uh, genetic makeup of the modern Kumara. Um, just looking at the origin and uh, a bit of history of the Kumara, the Kumara or sweet potato uh, is given the uh, Latin name Ipomia batatas was domesticated in Peru about 8,000 years ago. And it spread from there to South America, Central America, and North America, and also into Oceania. Uh, the Polynesians had grown the Kumara prior to the arrival of the Europeans. And so it uh, suggests there was a trade and uh, a voyaging uh, between the two, between Oceania and uh, Peru or uh, South America. 
and later the Portuguese and the uh, Spanish introduced the Kumara to the East Indies or South uh, East Asia and the Philippines uh, where it spreads to uh, Asia uh, and probably uh, the rest of the world. And uh, it's already mentioned that the Maori had brought the Kumara from Polynesia um, when the Great Fleet uh, migrated to New Zealand. And uh, one of the uh, source material or the original records was uh, Captain James Cook, who mentioned uh, seeing the paper mulberry, the ufi, the taro and the kumara growing in some of the areas he visited. The uh, cultivars or varieties of kumara today uh, were result of natural selection and later active human breeding. And uh, uh, I just want to mention the work of uh, Mantel, uh, Gregory Mantel, the uh, uh, father of genetics. Uh, he did his work around uh, 1850s. And so uh, prior to 1850s, uh, there wasn't much uh, knowledge about this uh, type of uh, uh, genetic uh, breeding. But in modern times, uh, Tonga, for example, has had a breeding uh, program of Kumara for many years. After the scab or Elsino patatas had devastated the Kumara uh, plantations in Tonga, and some of the popular susceptible varieties like Tonga Mai and Siare were lost. But fortunately, these varieties were saved and are available from the University of the South Pacific and South Pacific Commission, uh, now known as the Secretariat for the South Pacific Community. Uh, they are kept in uh, in vitro collections uh, in tissue culture. And uh, when I was working at the University of the South Pacific and the South Pacific Commission, it was one of the jobs uh, that I was uh, doing was looking after the uh, in vitro collections of Kumara. Uh, here are some pictures of uh, modern uh, Kumara varieties uh, in New Zealand. Uh, the tubers, as you can see, are very similar to the pictures of the uh, original Kumara brought by the uh, Great Fleet. Uh, the leaves are also very similar. Today, Kumara is a global crop. Uh, sweet potato is currently ranked as the seventh most important crop in the world with a total production of 103 million tons in 2013. And uh, it is produced largely in Asia uh, with 76.1%, followed by the African continent, uh, African continent with 19.5%. Uh, and the top five producers of sweet potato in 2014 were China, Nigeria, Uganda, Indonesia, and the United Republic of Tanzania. Uh, and sweet potato is one of the five most important crops in 40 developing countries besides rice, wheat, maize, and cassava. So Kumara has now become a very important uh, uh, crop in the world. <laughs> In the Pacific, uh, Kumra is uh, one of the big uh, uh, staple crops. And here's a picture of uh, how the Kumra is planted in Tonga, for example. The land is uh, plowed and, uh, and then ridged or furrowed. And then the uh, cuttings of the Kumra is planted on top of the ridges. 
Uh, and uh, this picture here shows um, a Kumara very similar to how it looks in uh, Tonga. Uh, most of the Kumara planted in Tonga flowers because uh, of the warm weather. And there is also a very uh, likely uh, hybridization going on uh, naturally, uh, which would uh, contribute to the local uh, fauna of the flora of the Kumara. Uh, Fiji also uh, grows a lot of kumara as well as some of the other Pacific Islands. Uh, in New Zealand, um, kumara, as already mentioned, uh, was brought by the uh, Maori in the Great Fleet from uh, Hawaii. And uh, it is grown mostly in Northland. Um, but uh, these uh, um, traditional uh, bushy varieties were uh, replaced by uh, new American hybrids uh, introduced by whalers in the 1850s. And these are the forerunners of the uh, Kumara varieties grown today. Uh, today, uh, there are three main varieties, the red kumara, uh, which is uh, red skin with a creamy white flesh, known as uh, Owaraka red, the gold kumara, or tokatoka gold, is golden skin and flesh, and is sweeter than the red kumara, and has a denser flesh, and the orange kumara, known as uh, Beauregard, which has uh, orange skin, orange flesh, and similar to the color of pumpkin. Uh, the picture here shows a uh, Kumara plot planted uh, by my cousin, actually, uh, a Tongan uh, gardener in uh, Ramarama in Auckland. And uh, you can tell in the foreground here, they were planted with a digging fork after the land was plowed. But in the back there, you can tell the uh, Kumara was planted in rows uh, using a tractor to reach the land. Uh, this picture shows a uh, Maori from the early 1900s. Uh, with a kumara harvest of uh, uh, one of the varieties introduced by the uh, whalers in the uh, 19th century, the 1840s, 1850s. As you can see here, there were very large red uh, tubers. The uh, kumara cultivation in New Zealand uh, is usually done in the North Island, uh, specifically uh, Northland, with uh, some grown in the Bay of Plenty in uh, Auckland and as far down as uh, Waikato. And there's also quite a lot of uh, backyard gardening going on. Many of the Pacific Islanders, for example, uh, grow kumara in their backyards or on uh, church-owned land or leased land. Uh, and just a bit of a uh, botanical uh, description here. Uh, the sweet potato is a herbaceous uh, perennial vine bearing alternate, alternate uh, heart-shaped or palmately lobed leaves and medium-sized uh, sympetalous or fused petals flowers. The edible tuberous root is long and tapered with a smooth skin whose color ranges between red, purple, brown and white. Its flesh ranges between white, yellow, orange and purple. And the uh, classification of Kumara, uh, like the uh, um, lectures uh, that we have done on banana, the uh, kumara belongs in the kingdom plantae or the kingdom of plants 
division angiosperms or the flowering plants, class Magnoliopsida, order Solanelles, family Convolvulaceae, and genus Ipomia, a species Ipomia batatas. And uh, let's just have a, a quick look at the uh, Kumbra varieties growing in New Zealand today. Uh, first, the Owai Raka red. This is what it looks like. Red skin and uh, a fairly uh, fat uh, root. Uh, this one is the gold Kumara or Toka Toka gold. And the third one is the orange Kumara, the Beauregard. And this is what it uh, looks like. And uh, Kumara production in New Zealand uh, is actually uh, not very big by uh, world standards, but uh, fairly large uh, by local standards. Um, in 2012, there was about uh, 1,300 hectares of Kumara planted. Uh, 1,204 of those hectares were grown in Northland and about 19 or so hectares grown in Auckland and Bay of Plenty. And uh, the crop and food research had quoted a figure of 22 tons per hectare. And so at that uh, yield, the total uh, production uh, uh, of Kumara per year in New Zealand would be around 26,000 tons. Um, now let's look at the uh, plant protection problems of Kumara in uh, New Zealand. Um, scab uh, caused by Elsinor batatas is uh, present in uh, most countries where Kumara is grown. But uh, as far as I can tell, and uh, it does not uh, have any records in the literature, uh, Elsino patatas is not present in New Zealand. So this is a very good uh, uh, advantage for the Kumara growers of New Zealand, because Elsino patatas is the most serious uh, fungal disease of uh, Kumara. But uh, there are records of uh, problems caused by uh, hukeko, which is a bird, kumara moth, black beetle, cricket, nematode, and white fly caterpillars. And I have seen uh, records or uh, mention in the literature that uh, the northern uh, kumara growers uh, actually spray their kumara sometimes and uh, probably some of these uh, uh, insects uh, causing it problems. The sweet potato weevil, uh, Cyclus formicarius, is the most severe weevil problem in the Pacific, but uh, as we shall see later, uh, uh, there are also several other species of uh, weevils that cause uh, problems. Uh, there are also uh, various other minor pests uh, recorded from the United States of America, uh, including the weevil and uh, banded uh, cucumber beetle and uh, silver leaf whitefly. Uh, let's have a quick look at the scab. Uh, the sweet potato scab caused by uh, the fungus uh, Elsino patatas is a very, very severe uh, leaf disease, as shown by those two pictures here. It causes uh, scabs on the leaves, a distortion, and um, uh, usually uh, um, death of the vine. And uh, there is a uh, mention of losses up to 70% in the literature 
Uh, SCAP is um, responsible for the disappearance of many varieties of Kumara from Tonga, uh, where they were grown uh, in large uh, areas uh, during the 60s and 70s. And the classification of SCAP, it belongs to the Kingdom Fungi, Division Escomycota, Class of Yomycetes, Family Meringiales, Order Elsinosiae, Genus Elsino, and Species Elsino Patatas. And uh, this is how you control uh, scab using uh, integrated uh, pest management. Uh, isolation by keeping distance out of your, uh, uh, the disease out of your island or country. This is very important. Uh, quarantine isolation uh, is a key uh, tool by the uh, plant protection uh, industry to keep out disease and insects which is the easiest and cheapest way of uh, controlling them. Uh, but if you do get them, uh, you can use uh, resistant cultivars or varieties. You can also uh, dip uh, susceptible variety cuttings in fungicide for 15 minutes before planting. And you can spray them every two weeks with fungicide until about a month before harvest. So that's about six to seven sprays in four months. And uh, let's have a look at the weevils. Uh, sweet potato weevil is uh, the most serious uh, insect pest of uh, sweet potato. Uh, there are five weevil species that are uh, mentioned in the literature which can cause uh, losses up to 100% uh, in cases where uh, plants uh, die from uh, the uh, infestation. And Cyclas formicarius, uh, as already mentioned, is the most serious uh, of the uh, weevils in Oceania. But there's also uh, Eusciphes uh, postfasciatus, uh, Cyclas uh, punctiolis and Cyclas uh, pruneus, uh, which are other weevils that um, cause uh, problems on uh, sweet potato. Uh, the widespread uh, infestation by the weevil is uh, actually uh, uh, mentioned in the literature to cause millions of dollars of losses uh, every year. And the four main species already mentioned, they have a uh, worldwide distribution with up to 80% losses. Uh, one of the ways that you can uh, overcome these weevils is using mixed cropping and intercropping. And they uh, appear to reduce the weevil numbers. For example, in one study, um, the number of weevils per kilogram uh, in a monocrop was reduced from uh, 217 weevils per kilogram down to only 4 to 11 uh, weevils per kilogram in a mixed crop uh, situation. Sanitation also is very important, uh, reducing the uh, infestation by uh, cleaning up uh, the immediate area. Uh, in Cuba, for example, uh, 0.7 tons of uh, crop residue could harbor as many as a million weevils. And uh, so uh, planting your kumara in that area will obviously cause 100% uh, destruction. So destroying uh, this residue by uh, um, flooding fields, for example, can reduce uh, weevil numbers significantly, or even burning uh, the dry material. Mulching and uh, plastic barriers uh, also appear to reduce infestation by up to 
55 percent the uh, use of uh, entomopathogenic nematodes and fungi is uh, biopesticides for example bovaria parthiana can be used for uh, biocontrol measures and there's actually uh, 700 uh, species uh, uh, of uh, uh, nematodes and fungi known to be uh, used as uh, biopesticides. The use of uh, sterile uh, male release has been infective, uh, effective in some studies. Uh, they can be uh, done together with pheromone traps to reduce the uh, number of uh, um, weevil uh, uh, effective uh, mating uh, pairs, I suppose. The early maturing sweet potato uh, has been uh, shown to be uh, less infected than the long maturing varieties, for example. So uh, if you plant a uh, sweet potato that you can harvest in three, four months, you don't get uh, a big problem uh, with uh, weevil as you get with a variety that you harvest in five months. And obviously it's the time, uh, uh, length of uh, time available to the weevil to uh, infest your crop. And this is how the weevil damage uh, appear on the Kumara tuber. On this uh, picture here on the left hand corner, uh, the weevil actually tunnels into the tuber and uh, basically destroys it. Uh, and it's usually the uh, larvae which uh, cause the damage. This is the larvae here eating uh, up this uh, tuber of Kumara. This is the weevil here on a uh, damaged uh, Kumara tuber, and these are the larvae here, and this is the adult weevil here. The uh, weevil life cycle starts off with the eggs, which are laid singly in cavities in the roots or stem. Um, and these uh, eggs uh, hatch into uh, larvae. Uh, this is the picture of the larvae here, um, which feed inside the roots or stems, and where oviposition occurs for 25 to 35 days, during which they complete three larval instars, or three uh, stages. And pupation takes place within the sweet potato roots or stem where they feed. And the mature larvae excavates a cell two to three times the size of its body in which pupation occurs. And the pupil uh, period lasts four to eight days. So um, slightly more than a month um, to complete uh, the life cycle from egg to uh, adult. And uh, as you have seen, um, very, very severe damage uh, is caused uh, to the uh, sweet potato tuber. Uh, this is the classification of uh, cyclist formicarius, which is the most common uh, weevil found in Oceania, in the Pacific Islands. Um, uh, cyclists belong to the kingdom Animalia, uh, phylum Arthropoda, or the uh, uh, insects with uh, exoskeletons, the class Insecta, order Coleoptera, family Prentidae, genus Cyclus, species Cyclus formicarius. There are also uh, <coughs> other pests, uh, which uh, we'll have a quick look at. Uh, <coughs> a banded cucumber beetle, uh, which is mentioned uh, in the literature, uh, the silver leaf white fly, and also the wire worms. And these are problems uh, mostly in the United States uh, 
in Florida where most of the sweet potato is grown. Um, just to have a quick look at uh, what uh, is needed in the uh, kumara or sweet potato industry. And uh, this is actually from the literature, but uh, it actually supports my view. Uh, for example, uh, DNA fingerprinting and related technologies uh, need to be developed to protect the work of plant breeders. Uh, we have spoken before about the uh, uh, large-scale uh, movement of the sweet potato in ancient times and also uh, in modern times. And there's a lot of breeding going on too. But uh, it's very difficult to protect your own uh, uh, varieties from your breeding program without any uh, uh, proof that the variety belongs to you. And this is why uh, DNA fingerprinting uh, would uh, give the plant breeder a uh, uh, advantage to protect uh, his uh, varieties once uh, they are registered. Uh, plant science and related technologies have to keep up with the global trade and theft of plant breeders' knowledge and results, sometimes through ignorance and lack of effective authority. And, and this is very uh, uh, common, uh, for example, in the Pacific Islands, where people uh, bring a lot of uh, uh, varieties from overseas, uh, often uh, just picking them up from uh, friends, relatives, or uh, the market. And um, usually uh, some of these uh, varieties uh, belong to somebody, but there is no uh, uh, effective way of uh, identifying them. And DNA fingerprinting would be a good way of doing that. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, piracy of music, uh, for example, is a very obvious um, uh, example of where the copyright of the owner of the music is disregarded in the global sharing or use of the music. And uh, usually because of ignorance or people don't really know about uh, copyright uh, rules, or apathy, they don't care, or lack of respect for existing authority and copyright. Uh, copyright is very important for music, and so uh, uh, for uh, plant material, uh, registration of uh, those varieties uh, is important for the plant breeder to uh, have a claim to his uh, work. And uh, DNA fingerprinting is one way of doing it, probably the best way. Uh, in New Zealand, there is a system for registration of new plant breeders' uh, varieties, but uh, uh, DNA fingerprinting is not uh, included at the moment, uh, probably because of the lack of uh, services or people providing that service. But uh, hopefully we can uh, do this in the future. And these technologies uh, uh, would pick up the uh, science and the plant breeders to uh, protect their work and also get rid of the thieves and uh, traditional uh, uh, people ignoring uh, the um, uh, plant breeders' rights. Uh, and thank you for watching. Um, our next lecture will be on uh, watermelon. And um, I will describe uh, some of the work I'm doing with uh, watermelons and also uh, some of the uh, ideas that uh, I want to share about the uh, uh, watermelon in New Zealand as well as the global watermelon industry. As we have seen in the banana lectures, uh, watermelon is the number one uh, fruit produced in the world 
and uh, it's very very important that uh, we have a good look at it and uh, discuss ways of uh, uh, how to improve and protect uh, our work uh, with watermelons.